to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. On it, I am proud to present former Iowa State basketball player and NBA veteran Paul Shirley. Paul is also an author of four books out there right now. And we have a great conversation talking about uh, growing up in a rural area in Kansas and kind of how he got to become a Power Five conference player, how he got to play pro overseas in the NBA. Uh, we talk about the best thing about college basketball overseas basketball in the NBA and some of the worst things as well, uh, some things that people don't know. Uh, we also talk about some fun stories about uh, him on the Bulls plane talking to Scotty Pippen while he's in uh, intense pain and other fun stuff as well. So uh, Paul Shirley on this podcast. And uh, if you like what you hear, go ahead and subscribe on all the major podcasting platforms. If you do want to re leave a review, please do so on Apple. And also you can subscribe uh, at the YouTube channel. We have some bonus content on there you won't get on the podcast. And feel free, uh, if any questions you have, uh, you can reach out to me. Um, and you can find all my contact info at prepathletics.com. So sit back, enjoy this great conversation with former NBA player, Paul Shirley. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh yeah, somebody wants me. All right, Paul, welcome to the podcast. Um, one thing I want to get into first is I'm fascinated about people that make it to the highest level of sports that come from small towns. And I know you come from a small town in Kansas. So what do you think that town possessed or was it the town that helped you get to the, the highest level? I, I say sometimes that um, I grew up in the country, but not on a farm, which was one of the boxes you could check when we did the 4-H record books when I was growing up, because they wanted to separate, like, do you live in a city? Do you live I don't know, on a farm? Or do you just like sort of live in between? And I was more actually farm kid than even small town kid. Uh, we lived at the intersection of two gravel roads. And I grew up like learning basketball in a gravel driveway. So in a lot of ways, I was, is it Bobby Chitwood from Hoosiers? Bobby Chit, uh, it had wood in the end. Bobby Chitwood, Chitwood. for yeah, sure. Yeah, that's it. I think that's, I don't remember if his first, well, his first name was. Anyway, I was probably more of that, right? So like we were feeding cows and taking care of chickens and um, learning baseball in the backyard and football in the backyard and basketball in the backyard. So for me, I think it was more that um, I found a thing that allowed me to be on my own in my backyard. I didn't, it didn't require my brothers to be involved. Like I have three younger brothers, but you can, you can still shoot around by yourself. Um, and so I think a lot of it was that um, it was a solitary activity mm -hmm. that I could work on at my own pace uh, and then go be tested um, with that I was at school or in Topeka, Topeka, Kansas, not far from where I'm from. And so we grew up playing. YMCA basketball and, and all sorts of youth leagues in the city, the big city of Topeka. Um, and so I, I, I think it helped to have that mixture of kind of meditative practice, the fact that I could just go do it whenever I wanted. Um, and then some kind of a, a test where I could evaluate like, all right, is this working? Is it not? Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, did you have like a strength coach or a trainer, any of that growing up? <laughs> <laughs> sorry no i know uh, I'm glad, but that's what everyone nowadays thinks they have to have a specialty yeah, yeah, yeah. trainers to get them to that level so that's yeah no and i think like it's it's it was always uh, intriguing to me the difference between the styles of strength training especially when i got to europe to play mm -hmm. in that i would run across i remember this dude nicola i can't remember his last name that i played with in spain who was six 10 probably and weighed like 205 pounds it was total string beans um but was immovable he was mm. so like whip strong and what he the way he was strong was functionally which now everybody talks about right like you know functional strength how can we make people but when i was in high school and college and after it was so much about like well we gotta i'm six foot nine and when i played i weighed up 230 to 
233 pounds. I could never really get above that. But there was always this like, we got to bulk you up. And, I'm, and my brain would be saying, I don't know, man, I feel like, you know, me throwing hay bales and learning how to arm bar people is probably better training than me doing deadlifts. Yeah. But there was just such a kind of one note attitude toward that. Similarly, me learning to be a pretty good baseball player helped my strength, right? Being a pitcher most likely allowed me to understand a little bit more about like the way the body moves. Um, and I think we have tried to parse out the components to strength and the components of, of being a basketball player without remembering that mostly it's an art, not a science. Mm. You know, like it would be hard to, it's hard to reverse engineer. How did I end up coming from the gravel driveway to the NBA? But it also had to do with not only playing a lot of basketball on my own, but watching a lot of basketball, being enamored with it's big Monday now. And so the big 12 is on and the, I think it was the big East back then. Yep. Um, so I'll watch those games and then it's Tuesday. So it's the sec and whatever else. Um, so that like, again, that idea of I could watch it, go practice it on my own, go test myself like that whole kind of circle. That was, that probably had a lot more to do with my development than me being, uh, driven or any kind of magic i mean my first my first strength coach i guess was my high school english teacher who <laughs> let me into the weight room in the summer because i was too embarrassed to go to the actual strength training that ever all like all the football players were going to because i was so mm. skinny and um i <laughs> so vividly remember i couldn't like put my hand on my head to wash the shampoo out of my hair after that, because I was, I was so little, I was just a little kid. You know, when I was my first driver's license, I was 5'11 and I weighed 120 pounds, which is pretty oh, good. Wow. You're a supermodel. That's great. But as a, I was a freshman in high school point guard on my freshman team, um, rail thin, you definitely, not only would you not have looked at me and thought that guy's going to play in the NBA someday, <laughs> but you wouldn't have thought that guy's going to play varsity basketball someday. Yeah. Yeah, when I hit my, I was six. When I hit my growth spurt, six seven, one forty five, I think. Wow. Uh, and yeah. just like, just you know, ribs. You're counting ribs, and then you know, yeah. start filling out. But uh, mm -hmm. I know it. Yeah, and you just, just get your, you just get pummeled in the mm -hmm. post. Just yeah. there's nothing you can do. Right? Yeah, and they're, they're of course they're like, you should, we should really get you in the post. And I had grown <laughs> up playing point guard, right, and right. and looking at the basket from front on, and just. Again, I think deep down, my brain was like, mm, I'm not sure that tracks, but you just, you just listen to people yeah. and you say, all right, you must know better than I do. Yeah. One thing we talk about on here, Paul, and you and I have talked about this uh, in our previous conversations is we're, I, it's futile, but I'm trying to kind of figure out the code to make it to the professional level. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the quote I heard recently is there's been 5,000 players to ever play in the NBA since its inception. And, you know, I talked to a lot of prep school coaches that have coached pros. I've had some pros on here to include family members that have played in the pros. And I'm just trying to figure out, like, what is the one thing that potentially these guys possess that no one else has? And I think something we kind of touched on in our last conversation is there's some kind of slight or some kind of minor potential trauma that might have led someone to like, you know what, I'm going to show that person get in the gym longer than anyone else to prove them wrong. Mm -hmm. And, you know... What, did you have something like that that kind of planted that seed that gave you the drive and the passion to get ultimately to the NBA? I, I was weird. I think that helped. Um, I felt uh, strange a lot of the time. I just didn't really fit in, or at least I felt like I didn't fit in. It wasn't like I, I don't know, I, I had perfectly adequate social skills. Um, but I, I think I just always felt kind of detached from the people I was around. And, and so in some ways for me, sports worked a lot like art does for other people. Like a lot of musicians talk about feeling isolated or, or just strange. And uh, basketball gave me uh, an outlet for expressing myself. Honestly, it was um, a chance to not have to be the polite, nice kid. I could go out there and kind of be a bit of a maniac. 
and uh, I felt really free and and more myself than I think I did most of the rest of the time. Uh, and then as I aged, I think I noticed that that made people like me, right? That that there was they were then attracted to me, not just in a male female way, but it was they were interested in what I was doing. And I think that was addicting also. So it was a, maybe a combination of um, feeling strange and then noticing that uh, the thing I did in order to feel more normal actually helped get me more attention. Um, so I, I think, I don't know if you can, you know, I don't know if, how to set that up in a human being, um, but it worked for me. I don't know that it was, you know, you mentioned trauma and that kind of thing. I, I don't know that my method as a youth was constructive because I was playing out of a, a way to kind of like avoid discomfort as opposed to trying to strive for something. I mean, I was striving on some degree or on some level like for these next sort of markers, but a lot of the time I was just trying to succeed because I feared failure so much. What if you would have not been considered or felt weird? Like what if you would have just felt accepted with your classmates and just blended in and not had that feeling? Would that have taken that drive away, do you think? I think some of it. Yeah, I, yeah. I think that you see that with a lot of people who are like the, the stereotypical high school jock who's really popular is often less motivated be, because they are popular right yeah now i don't want to i think in my small town there were there were very few of us who were either popular or not because you know in a class of 55 there's not a lot of room for like a bunch of clicks mm. um but i think that can work against you you know I, we used to say that in the in the summer leagues you could uh you would never you should never fear a tan kid like the, the white kid who's been at the pool all day, like he's never going to be good because he's, he's spending all of his time hanging with his buds at the pool. He's not in the gym because like the, the pale white kids are much more fearsome because they're stuck in the gym all day long. Um, and I think there's something to that, right? Like if you're, if you're too okay with yourself when you're young, you don't need that outlet. I would, again, back to musicians. I, I feel like if musicians didn't feel a little weird or if artists didn't feel a little weird, I'm not sure we would get great music, great art. Do you see what it, I'm saying? Does that yeah. track for you? It does. Well, how about this too? Since you have been around pros in, in different countries around the world, was there something your teammates possessed that you think you can say, oh yeah, every one of these guys had this. So if you want to get to this level, you better at least have this. I think there, there was a... Um... It's a combination of, I was actually just thinking about this the other day. I, had, I met with an agent right out of college who was reluctant to take me on because he thought I wasn't desperate enough. So he said, he's like, in my mind, you have to be so desperate to make it that you'll do anything. Now, I understand what he means but all of the evidence shows that to do um, challenging things in your life, you need to come from some security. Now, there are exceptions to that. There are guys who like, grew up in, in nothing that make it. I think those are more like football players a lot of the time. Um, in my experience, most of the great basketball players I know came from some level of stability because it's such a it's such a leap of faith to think like, well, I'm going to go play college basketball or I'm going to go play professional basketball. So even the guys that they may have oversold their troubled background, there was usually some stable base. So again, from a psychological standpoint, most people who succeed do come from some level of security. That's what allows you to feel like you can make that leap. So I think contrary to maybe a popular belief, there was a lot more launching pad availability than you would realize, especially with like the European players that I was around. Um, even like my college roommate was from uh, Beaumont, Mississippi. His name was Stevie Johnson. And uh, his dad had played in the NFL. Um, 
Stevie ended up playing four years at Iowa State and then played a year of football at Iowa State. Actually got drafted as a football player after never having played football until his fifth year of college. But his life was, it was, he had a pretty good base to work from. Um, there was a guy, Martin Rancic, who played at Iowa State, whose dad had been a professional handballer in uh, Slovakia. And again, you know, pretty steady. A lot of the guys that washed out had the, the checkered, awful backgrounds that, that mm. didn't really work out. So I think there is a misconception there about like, if you're truly desperate, there's a chance you'll make it just because you're so afraid of failure. But that's a really thin line to walk on. Yeah, that's interesting. I never heard that take on that before. Yeah, hmm. interesting. I, mean, okay. I think you have to have some, like, I think there has to be some internal desperation, but if the circumstances outside are too chaotic, it just, we don't see that working in any walk of life, really. Like it, yeah, there's going to be your outliers, but that's, that's, right. what they, that's why they're outliers. Yep. You know, I heard in my last interview with my college coach from Air Force that the big thing he says is passion. Mm-hmm. Like, you've got to be able to, and that's what, you know, a lot of the, the same thing I'm hearing over and over again is the guy that gets in the gym when no one else wants to get in there. You know, the guy who just played two hours, scored 30 points and they lost, he's in the mm-hmm. gym for an extra two hours. Cause he just, he can't live with that loss and maybe the missed shots he had. Mm-hmm. It's like almost a sickness, right? Yeah. I mean, that's what I think sometimes we mistake passion for obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, I had a teammate at Iowa state, another guy named Jake Sullivan, who at some point, had was diagnosed with OCD right like just that inability to let it go if he missed too many shots and so I think that's where um it can be a little bit of a demon right like if you're trying to there's perfectionism at work uh, that you know people can recognize even if they're not athletes that doesn't necessarily lead you to success it might get you part of the way Right. But the people who I think really push it to the absolute top who got to be better than I was, were actually able to let go of some of that. I think that being driven by some of these traumas or uh, slight disorders it can get you a ways, but it, it probably doesn't get you all the way to the top. Yeah, good point on that. Let's get off the topic here. A lot of my, a lot of kids out there, uh, want to play D1, right? And ideally, mm-hmm. everyone wants to play high major and then make it to the NBA. And you played in a high major program. You guys had success there, um, a couple of points away from a Final Four. What's the best part of being in a high major program? And what's the worst part? Maybe some things that people don't obviously know about each, each end of the spectrum. I think for me, I was allowed to be um, a role player and then have a chance to go play professionally because I was at such a successful big program, right? Like if I had averaged 10 points and seven rebounds at Valparaiso, I don't think I would get any looks, but because we were really good and, and because people are kind of aware that like 10 points and seven rebounds is pretty hard in the big 12. Um, that meant that, that I was given a little bit of a pass on like stats and stuff like that. Uh, I think the the difficult part is that the with in any world where there's a lot of money at stake, there's going to be a lot of pressure to perform. That's just how it is, right? And so when your coach is making millions as opposed to hundreds of a, of thousands, there's less patience for finding your way. Um, I when I was in college played with. I was there for five years because I redshirted, which if people are not familiar, means I sat out a year, practiced, but didn't play. Um, I played with 49 other players. So an average of 10 new players a year, right? So that was a very different experience from my brother who played at Colgate, right? Where he, I don't know that he has, he has some lifelong friends out of that. I don't have as many friends that are teammates because a lot of the guys were there for six weeks or three months and then they, when moved on down the line because there was that feeling that we just don't have time, right? Like we got to move on. We, I went through a coaching change at Iowa state, which also meant that there was a, a big um, exodus, of course. Uh, so I, I think as you get to those higher levels, it becomes a lot more like being in the pros where it's 
more mercenary, more, what can you do for me now? And I can't imagine what that's like currently with the transfer rules and all of that changing we had still some continuity at iowa state but i would guess that if that were transported if that team were transported to now we had a lot of guys who were the seventh eighth ninth guy that would have just left right and said i can't deal with this i need to go somewhere else and then they would have been the seventh or eighth or ninth guy in that next place because there's there's rarely can you just solve that by moving right all right what about the best and worst part of playing in international professional leagues? Oh, um, worst part is not getting paid. <laughs> um, <laughs> when I played in Greece, my contract was for $100,000, which as a 23-year-old seemed like the most money that I was ever going to see in the world. And um, by the end of the year, they technically owed me one hundred and five dollars because of some playoff bonus, and they had paid me $52,000. Mm-hmm. And we uh, sued them, of course and won the lawsuit and they appealed and then we won the appeal and then the greek ministry of sport because so many teams were in arrears made all of the greek teams promise to never do it again and then absolve them of all their debts so like it's funny because i I don't know that funny is the right word it was um it is i guess sometimes hard for people to understand because they might say, well, you know, you, you still got paid $52,000 to play basketball, but when somebody signs a contract and you yeah. agree to perform an activity for that contract, it can get under your skin when you don't get paid for those services. So that, that really, I think that probably changed my attitude towards staying in Europe because, you know, I think I was a absolute dream of a European player, right? I was slightly undersized for the NBA, but for Europe, I was well-suited. I, you know, I played in a much more European way, but that first experience of not getting paid turned me off pretty quickly. Um, The best thing I think is just the perspective that anyone gains from not just traveling, but getting to live in a different country. When my parents would come visit me in in the various places I played. I played in Greece, but also for three teams in Spain and one team in Russia. They would remark on like how much fun and how interesting it was to come get to stay with someone who actually lived there because Mm -hmm. it's it's so different from being a tourist. And I think getting to fully engage in those countries was really, I, I think again, especially for somebody who comes from a small town, informative and from a developmental standpoint, kind of priceless. Yeah. And a lot of um, players that play in Europe are just pining to get to the NBA. Was that you? Were you just pining to get your chance to get back over to the States or were you actually present and enjoying your opportunity over there in Europe? I had a mixture when I, when I first got to Greece, I was overjoyed that I was getting to play basketball for money Mm -hmm. that I wasn't in college anymore. I was in a lot of ways, a, I was in some ways better suited to be a pro than to be a college player because the college basketball is so like, even as I envision it, it's just very claustrophobic and everybody's kind of on top of each other and it's just people jumping over each other's backs and the pros is a little more technical and I think I was much more suited to that game. So I, I was just happy that people were excited by the way that I played basketball again. Um, but I, but then as I, the next few years, when it started to be clear, like, oh, I am probably good enough to play in the NBA. Then there was that Mm. desire to prove that I could do it, even though I wasn't really ever all that happy in the NBA because it was so sterile when you're in Europe, you know, as annoying as it might seem, you have a roommate, you have team dinners and that bonds you together. Whereas in the NBA, there's a lot of alone time every player is kind of his own little corporation and that isn't terrible. Like it's, there are a lot worse things to have to go through, but from a, from a sports perspective where a lot of what you love about sports is the connection and the sense that you're all in this together. I think the NBA um, felt really fractured to me. Yes. That's my third question. So we talked about the best and worst of college, the best Mm -hmm. and worst of, of playing professionally overseas. Now, what's the best and worst thing about playing in the NBA that people might not know. It might not be obvious. I was 
um, never, I never got tired of staying in nice hotels. <laughs> it was just astonishing when we would pull up to a Four Seasons and I would think, I get to have my own room here? This is bananas. This doesn't make any sense. Um, and then I think in the NBA, it, it, it is that, that it was just that sterility of things that, you know, like in, in Greece, there was a, an away game where somebody broke into the locker room and stole everybody's wallets. So like, I still don't have a social security card because of that. And that's, that wasn't really super fun at the time, but it, um, it brings you together and it's weird. And you're you know, like all of those experiences, I think are bonding even, you know, in, in Europe, when I played in Spain towards the end of my career, I was pretty well established in Spain and started to get to know the other Americans. And we would obviously be playing kind of on the same schedule. So we would often connect flights through Madrid or Barcelona at the same time. And that meant we got to the, you know, the, the two Americans on each team would each get together and hang out. And, and there was something really special about feeling like you were um, with people that you understood, but in a foreign land, which I'm sure the European players go through here. Nice. Um, so I think like for me, socially, it was the NBA was tough. I was always hanging out with like the trainers because they had a little more cohesion. They were going to stick around. The players were kind of in and out and they, the guys who get really good, a lot of times become kind of sequestered from the rest of the team because they are like their own little corporation in a way yeah what's uh what's something about the nba that no one really talks about or discusses in the public that you think is pretty interesting aside from the corporation thing and being sterile that's that's something you don't hear too much but like is there something else behind the scenes that people be like oh wow i didn't realize that i i have struggled not recently but when i first got of, out of my career with um, arranging my schedule um, I don't know that this is entirely unique to the NBA, but I think it's somewhat specific in that people forget that games are always at night and that you don't go immediately to sleep right after a game. That I, I can remember when I played for the Phoenix Suns, I was there for half of a year, which meant that I got to kind of settle into a routine. Even in Phoenix, we would struggle to find places that were still open serving food at 10, 30 or 11. So like we would all end up at, there was this one hamburger place in, uh, can't remember which part of Phoenix, uh, that my friend who is the, uh, he was actually like community relations and, and youth basketball uh, head and used to play in a poker game I would host. He discovered this, this hamburger place. So we started going there. And then the other guys found out that that was a place that would actually serve food. So they start, so like the entire not the entire, but a lot of the Phoenix Suns would end up at this kind of strange strip mall hamburger place because it was the only thing that was open at 11 o'clock at night serving food still, which I went through that a lot actually in, in various stops when I played for the Kansas City Knights of the ABA, you know, same kind of thing, games at eight over at 1030, you know, you don't get out of there till 1115. There are not very many places where you can eat at that hour and you're also starving. Yes. Um, and then that, you know, that sort of like off, sets the rest of your schedule if you don't go to bed till 12 30 or 1 you're not realistically going to get up till 9 or 10 because you're also recovering from a goddamn basketball game right so i think it's it was it seemed very normal to me because i was so used to it. but when i got back into real life and i realized oh wow yeah people are starting their days a little earlier than i am it was a bit of an adjustment yeah i bet, I bet. and you can now when you go out to eat everything's open so right one of the benefits of not being a professional athlete. That's right. right? Yeah, I don't have to worry about that. I'm, I mean, I'm asleep by the time I would have been eating back then. Yeah. So aside from being a, a professional athlete, you've also written, penned four books. And when I went to the bookstore, I'd always see, can I keep this? Can I keep my jersey uh, on the shelf? And I was like, one day I'll get that. And I finally got it on my Kindle when my newborn was, you know, a month old, and I had to get up at like one in the morning and rock her. And mm -hmm. that's the book I read. And then shortly thereafter, I met you. And I was like, oh, I just read your book. And then I got your book, Stories I Tell on Dates. And I, there's only one other book I've laughed out loud as much during. And that was Seth Rogen's recent book. Mm. I think it's called Homecoming or Homeroom or something. 
it's mm -hmm. hilarious. Um, it's like reading about a different super bad you've never read before. Some mm -hmm. great scenes. But you've got a scene in that book, Stories I Tell on Dates, about you on the Bulls plane, uh, laying on the floor next to one of your heroes, Scotty Pippen. Mm -hmm. um, can you just give a brief overview of that story? Because I, I remember stopping my wife like, Josie, I, I've got to tell you this story. It's amazing. Right. <laughs> Yeah, the, uh, so the, the backstory there is that I had, I mentioned the Kansas City Knights earlier. Yep. I was playing for the ABA's Kansas City Knights and had uh, gone off to a uh, one-day tryout with the Chicago Bulls. And after several hours of sitting in the residence inn, wondering if they were going to pick me or one of the other three guys that was on the tryout, they picked me and I signed with the Bulls, uh, which was my second stint in the NBA. It felt a little different this time because I was just better. You know, I was a, it was a year later than my first 10-day uh, contract with the Hawks and the Bulls were really bad. And I could tell that Scott Skiles was quite uh, exhausted by Tyson Chandler and Eddie Curry and some mm -hmm. of the other dudes. So I quickly got the chance to play. And one of the first games that I played a fair bit in was against the Indiana Pacers. I played what is still my career high in minutes of 27 minutes. Um, I think I had played like 19 straight minutes in the second half, which is crazy. Like nobody ever does that. It was just that he was so fed up with his guys that the Bulls had drafted that he was trying to prove, prove a point, right? Like this guy's making no money. He'll, you know, run through a wall to stick around here. And I kind of knew that that was a situation. Like I knew that my chance to stick around was based on my willingness to run through walls. So even though we were down by 30 with five minutes to go, I saw Austin Crozier roll into the basket from across the lane and left my man to go try to take a charge, which, you know, listeners may know is when the defender puts his arms up or his arms down and lets the offensive player run into him. And it's the sort of play that coaches love because it shows hustle and sacrifice. Heart. And yeah. <laughs> But I got there late, and as I lifted my arms, my rib cage came up, Crozier's knee went into my side and my kidney and spleen hit my backbone like two water balloons being thrown at a telephone pole and exploded on impact and started bleeding inside. Um, Wait, I both your kidney and spleen, both of them? Yeah, yeah, my left kidney and my spleen. Um, but I didn't know that, of course. I was just like, this hurts some and thought that I'd probably like cracked a rib or broken a couple of ribs or something. So also knowing that I was on a 10 day contract and that people on 10 day contracts don't get to like make a big to do out of being injured. I rolled over to the out of bounds line and was just trying to catch my breath again, knowing that something's not right, but not really sure what it was. Um, the game, you know, ended without me because I was in no condition to be playing. They took x-rays at Conseco Fieldhouse, and I didn't have broken ribs, which I was, pretty alarmed by it because I was like this hurts a lot for not broken ribs we then went and showered and I was starting to feel a little queasy but my blood pressure wasn't dropping so they just were like all right let's go back to Chicago so they had made a bed for me on the team plane because they knew I wasn't doing great and as I was laying there I was like all right you, all you got to do is get through the next hour get back to your hotel and you can put yourself back together. It's sort of like a, a movie scene where there's like a retired uh, FBI agent who's gotten beaten up. And he's like, if I can just get home, I can, I'll fix, I'll patch myself up. So then we roll down the runway and then we start to take off and I can tell that things are not going to be good because what's happening. I don't know this, but my, body is filling up with blood, right? Like this, this part of my body is now filling up with blood, especially because of the altitude change, I think. And now just time has passed and my adrenaline's wearing off. So I had to turn to Scotty Pippen, who was sitting in the seat next to my the little bed that they had created. And I was like, Scotty, you got to go get the trainer. And I remember him looking down at me with such disdain because he didn't really know who I was. I'd been there for seven days or something. Right. And he's like, this sissy is just begging for attention or whatever else. So he sighs and gets up and goes to get the trainer. And then from there, I don't really, I mean, I remember patches of the next 45 minutes, but it's a lot of like me screaming and crying and also being aware that I was screaming and crying 
and that I was never going to live this down if it was just a bruised rib. Like, I, I it was it hurt so much that like it nothing will ever hurt as much to me ever again. In fact, I got to a point that I can vividly remember where I was thinking I would be fine with dying now. Like this is never going to stop, and I will be. It would be perfectly acceptable to just die. Um, I did not die, as you can tell. And um, what ended up happening was that that part of my body got so full of blood that it actually stopped the bleeding. Like there was no place for the blood to go anymore. Um, and I was in the hospital for nine days after that. And it really put a wrench in the spanner of my career, but it also connected me back to the things I really cared about, about basketball. I think, you know, even that action of going over to try to take that charge, that wasn't, that's not really why I loved basketball. You know, I loved basketball because of the feeling of getting better and the team camaraderie and those kinds of things. And I think that in a way was a lesson, right. That I needed to rethink the way I played. And so I spent that summer with a man named Scott Wedman, who had played for the uh, Boston Celtics for a long time. He had been my coach of the Kansas City Knights. And because I was so wrecked bodily, uh, I could do nothing more than to just stand in front of the basket and, and take apart my shot. And so he redid the way that I shot, but he also redid the way that I thought about basketball, um, opened me up to some of the stuff that I still talk about now. He was the first to give me the inner game of tennis, which is a lot about the mental side of sports, but also of kind of systematic thinking in general. We got into meditation and vis visualization and really changed the way that I looked at not only basketball, but life, um, looked at it less from a perspective of being fearful and, um, and like I said earlier, playing from a place of uh, kind of a scarcity mindset and more going towards an abundance mindset of, mm -hmm. yeah, of course this shot's going to go in, you know, I'm a really good shooter and I've practiced this. And if it doesn't, the next one will go in. Um, so I got a lot more optimistic. I also, I think became a lot more at peace with myself because of that injury and because of the Scotty Pippen assisted, uh, wrecking of uh, not he didn't he had nothing to do with the wrecking but scotty pippen and assisted plane ride i then that that year went off to training camp with the phoenix suns uh, made the opening day roster but then got cut soon after that and um when i got released um i had kind of forgotten about this until later which i will mention but when i got released i wrote a, a, a note on the dry erase board to the team just saying like hey guys thanks so much for letting me be here i had a blast. That was the Phoenix Suns of Steve Nash and Mike D'Antoni had just gotten there with Mario Stoudemire. It was a really healthy team. Like it was just well run and you could just tell that it was a functional place. So I was, you know, disappointed that I had to go, but also in a place at that point in my life where I just wished them nothing but the best, which I probably would not have been able to do the year before. At any rate, I quickly signed a contract to go to Russia and thought I would love it. I was really interested in what Russia would be like, hated it from the time my plane touched down in Kazan, Russia. It was scary and I didn't know what was happening most of the time. So I left after two months with no real plan. In fact, I turned down $55,000 a month to stay in Russia because I was so fed up with the team and also my career. I was just done. You know, I just decided that I was 26. I just turned 26, I think. And, uh, I was like, I'm not, I'm not, this isn't fun anymore. I'm just going to go home and live for a while. And then as you know, fate would have it, I got home to my parents' house to open some Christmas presents that I'd missed. And my agent called that same night and said, sit down because I've got some news. The Phoenix Suns tomorrow are going to trade three players away for one player, which was Jimmy Jackson. And I got you a contract for the last half of the year with an option for next year. And I think it, you know, it could be, it's kind of trite to think, well, one thing led to the next, right? You know, I got hurt and I changed the way I thought about basketball. And then I was so ready to give up on it if it couldn't be done the right way that I ended up signing the longest contract of my career. But 
I think there was something to that, you know, like that I was able to draw this conclusion of the world sent me this message and it caused me to wake up. And I, I feel really good about the way I finished my career because of that. I ended up, of course, the, the son's time was great, but then other weird shit happened and I ended up playing in Spain and I fell in love with a girl in Spain and got to live in Barcelona sort of separate from basketball for a while, finished my career in Malaga, Spain, which is the best European team I ever played for, Unicaja Malaga. Um, and then that was it. And I was able to walk away feeling like I had um, gotten everything out of it that I could have, you know, like there's probably a world where I was the eighth or ninth or 10th guy on an NBA team for 12 years. And you would never have noticed. You'd be like, well, yeah, that guy's okay, but whatever. But for me, it feels like I, I squeezed the most that I could out of my career, just from an experience perspective and kind of a diversity of, of life paths perspective. Have you seen the movie Sliding Doors? It's Gwyneth Paltrow. Long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. That movie we saw as a team in college and uh, it, it blew our minds, right? Mm -hmm. It really screwed with us because mm -hmm. every instance you're like, did that just change the course of my life forever? Mm -hmm. And I know it is, it is, you know, a, a trope to say that, that, you know, if you wouldn't have taken that Austin Crozier charge, like, you know, what would you have never met Scott? Would you have ever figured out abundance versus scarcity? You can't, you can't play those games, but you kind of can in a little bit of a fun way. Yeah. And uh, it's just amazing how, when people think they're at their lowest, it actually is the thing they absolutely needed to get yeah. to where they eventually end up. So um, yeah, anyone that, out there. That's I, I, I go back to, there's a part I left out of that story, which is, is maybe the, the takeaway now. I, I, I think it's interesting. And that was sort of the thrust of stories I tell on dates is how our stories change over time based on who we're with state of life. I think that the best thing that came out of all of that wasn't just that I got to play with the sons or just that I met Scott Wedman. It was that I got back to being who I really am. Mm -hmm. And who I really am is the sort of guy that when he was the 11th or 12th man for the sons would start writing about it and get a book deal because of it. Right. Like that was in some way, that was the most pure version of me, which was let's not take this so seriously, you know? So, I, you know, I, got in trouble or not in trouble, but like I wrote once about how Alvin Gentry, who was an assistant for the Suns, and I would stand outside the huddle and watch the kiss cam during the timeouts. And people are like, well, shouldn't you be paying attention to what's going on in the huddle? And you're like, no, it doesn't matter. I'm not, they're not putting me in right now. So like, I'm going to watch the kiss cam and we're going to laugh about it. And Alvin Gentry doesn't need to be paying attention. His job was to prepare for it. He's not, mm. you know, he's not doing anything right now. And also this is a sport who cares really. So I think like that was the, the real upside of all that was the most successful I was as an NBA basketball player didn't have that much to do with me playing basketball, but that was also the most me that I could be, you know, it was me wise cracking about the kiss cam. And then because of that, then people being desperate to interview me because they're like, well, they're like, well, we finally found a guy with a personality let's get him on espn we want to uh move on to the next opponent uh, everyone played hard tonight yeah, right, you, right. You're, the, yeah. you're the guy not saying all those canned answers right no would, yeah it would be like steve nash had a, a cluster over here and then amari would have a cluster but his was not very big because he would he was kind of angry at them at, at all times but then i would have a cluster the guy who didn't play because they would just be like well paul will say something funny <laughs> about what happened even though he didn't play in the game yeah, no kidding. That's awesome. That's a good story there. Hey, another story from the book um, was your mom was your sex ed teacher in school. Yeah, that that to me just when I read that sentence, like, oh my gosh, I can't. I met your mom, sweet lady. But uh, I, tell me what that was like, because to me that there would be nothing more horrifying to a junior high kid than than that sentence right there. Yeah, that's. I think it. Uh, like my mom and I have a pretty. My mom and all of my brothers and I, I guess, have a pretty open dialogue about like what life is really like. And she's heard entirely too much about my sex life. In fact, has had to read sometimes about my sex life. Um, but I can always pin that blame back on her because she was my sex ed teacher. I think it's hard for some of us to remember how 
filled with anxiety you are in seventh grade, where like all you want is for everything to just get through the day without being made fun of yes. or without doing something wrong. So yes, in home ec, when my mom walked in to teach sex ed, which I knew was coming, of course, um, I was immediately on guard, you know, like my heart rate must have been 130 beats per minute, because I'm just like, please don't let this go badly. And it did. Uh, she put up the slides about chlamydia and gonorrhea and syphilis and what it looks like. Of course, that's pretty boilerplate. But my mom being very, um, I would say progressive, she was teaching like safe sex, which was even in the 1980s, 90s, a little ahead of its time for rural mm -hmm. Kansas. Like she would actually have to go to board meetings sometimes and, and uh, advocate for teaching kids about condoms, right? Because they want to do like abstinence only education. Anyway, so my mom gets out a condom. And when I was around her and would tell the story, I would say like, so my mom would get out a condom and a banana and unroll the condom on the banana. And then one time that I was around her that she was telling this, she's like, Paul, stop. That's not how it went. And I was like, oh, you know what? I must have made this worse in my head like you do, right? Like some, sometimes with stories that are traumatic, you will actually like make them a little worse than that. And maybe I've done that here. And she goes, Paul, I didn't use a banana. I just used my whole arm for the condom. And I was like, oh man, no, I actually made the story better in my head. Like I... I improved the story to make it seem less traumatic for myself. So yeah, as she's standing there with the condom on her forearm, uh, this, this kid from across the way goes, do better, son's never going to have to use one of those. And I burst into tears immediately, of course. Yeah. And it was the ultimate uh, poor outcome that I had been dreading. Just as I had suspected, something really went awry. And, uh, and I had to sit there with the tears in my eyes because my mom couldn't come to my defense or yeah. things would have gotten worse. So I just had to cry through the rest of sex ed. She would have hugged you and one arm would have been uh, protected from an STD. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Kept the tears off of her forearm for sure. Oh, well, I know you didn't come on here to plug your books, but I'm going to plug them for you. You're like, can I keep my jersey? Great book, especially love basketball and want to hear behind the scenes on playing in the NBA and internationally and, and getting to that, you know, the high major level. And in stories I tell on dates, it's, it's also got basketball in it. But I'm telling you, you and Seth Rogen are, are on par as far as comedy writing goes. So thanks, man. And you also got a book, Ball Boy, and the process is the product as well. So mm -hmm. um, you're also a an author. So uh, last couple of questions. We're going to do some quick hitters here, Paul. And um, and then, um, you know, uh, there's some pretty fun ones. Favorite movie of all time? Princess Bride. Ah, good choice. Best player you ever played against? Hmm. Um, I'm going to say because of the unstoppability of him, uh, a dude from Topeka, Kansas named Tony Barksdale that, uh, that played at Highland Park High School and uh, I think went on to play in college, but gave me fits when we were in high school. Because Did you have to guard was, chat? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Because he was, as a big, as a tall guy, you'll know, he was probably only 6'3", but he could like play in the post and God, mm. just unstoppable. And I found that to be true throughout my career that I could always like, I could always handle a guy taller than I was, but those like short compact guys would always give me trouble. Um, but, but a more recognizable name, because that's not a fun answer for your listeners because they're probably not from Topeka. Everyone um, knows Tony Barksdale. Paul, yeah. come on. <laughs> um, the I think the most challenging situation that I found myself in was uh, Vladimir Rodmanovich. You know oh him? yeah, yep, barely. Yeah, so Minnesota. I uh, played for when I was I was I think I was just in training camp and I had to guard him when he played for the Sonics, and he was impossible to guard because he didn't care where he was on the court. He would shoot from anywhere. He didn't always make it but he didn't care if he didn't make it he'd shoot the next one and then the third one and the fourth one and the fifth one and if you're like out there trying to make a team you just don't want a guy hitting like four threes on you in a row and he just he was just like bloodless and and didn't care like there was no it didn't matter if it was garbage time or middle of the game he was going to fire from anywhere and that scared the hell out of me yeah that's interesting you know you talked about 
a smaller guy and how that screwed you up. When my cousin Brad played in the NBA, he played Yao Ming and would always tear Yao up. And I was like, oh, yeah. how do you score on a seven foot six guy? But, but Pal Gasol used to just tear Brad up. Like Brad could oh. do nothing against Pal. And I just, as an outsider looking in, it was confounding. But I asked him, I was like, hey, who, you know, you've been in this league a while. Who's the hardest players for you to guard? Mm-hmm. And it was Kevin Garnett and Dirk Nowitzki because those guys could just, you know, stretch it out. Right. Um, yeah, I think it's it's any guy who plays in a way that is um, difficult to predict. Yeah. Right. Like, I would have to guard Amari Stoudemire in practice basically every day for a long time, and he was actually pretty easy to guard because you're like, well, I'll just try to get him to shoot an 18 footer, and it's usually not going to be that effective if I can just keep him from getting to the basket. Things mm-hmm. will be okay. So, like, once you identify a guy's one Achilles heel, you can usually deal with them defensively but right with a guy like Dirk Nowitzki or when I was in college I had to guard Paul Pierce sometimes and like Paul Pierce in college was basically unstoppable um, mm-hmm. that was tricky uh, to say the least yeah we don't have time for this one but your Roy Williams story also classic <laughs> love that one that that has to be in your trophy book of best memories of your life, yeah. but that's yeah. a teaser. You got to read about that one. Yeah. yeah you gotta, you'll have to, that one's <laughs> definitely, that's, I feel like that one is featured pretty prominently in stories I tell on dates. Yeah. That's a great yeah. one. Uh, most points you ever scored in a game. Uh, um, yeah. I, of, of record was, I don't know, 37 in high school, but I'm pretty sure that in an ABA game in Fresno where I'm not sure they paid anyone to keep score. I think I might've scored 50 or something like, it was. I mean, in the ABA, there was no defense being played. Like people are probably not familiar, but they may remember the CBA. The ABA was sort of like a competitor to the CBA. At the time that I played in it, there were only seven teams. They were in Fresno, Vegas, Long Beach, Juarez, Mexico, Tijuana, Mexico, Kansas city, and a team in New Jersey of all places. And we actually had amazing games. Like uh, there was in Long Beach, that team had uh, Demar Johnson and uh, Joaquin Hawkins and a bunch of dudes who like played in the NBA for a long time. We'd have great games, but they would always be like 140 to 120. And I think like Joe Crispin, do you remember Joe Crispin played at Penn State? It doesn't matter. He played, he was on my ABA team. And I feel like he just wanted to take the night out for shooting. And we did a lot of pick and roll and I, I would not be surprised if I scored 50 points in that game and nobody will ever know. We know now. Everyone, the millions of listeners of this podcast now know. Right, so. yeah, just a little uh, Bruce Springsteen glory days. Well, there there's you no go. record of it, but I'm pretty sure I scored 50 points in an ABA basketball game once. I'll take it. Uh, your favorite arena to play in when you were in the NBA? Oh, I thought you were going to say period. Allen Fieldhouse at Kansas City. Well, Allen, yeah, I, mean, I like, figured that'd be. There's just no real comparison to that i was actually back at ku recently um and you just you forget how everything in there smells like popcorn and humans and how Mm -hmm. reassuring and satisfying that is it's just so it's so much like what a college basketball arena should be uh favorite nba arena oh boy they're all the same man they suck they're just sterile boring yeah Mm -hmm. wait Back to Allen Fieldhouse, you know what people might not know is like the team has to walk through the concourse to get from the Mm -hmm. locker rooms to the court. So like they just put a rope up and there they are, which is kind of old school and neat too. Yeah, no, if they ever if they ever tear that down, college basketball should just cease to exist. They won't just it just would be like that's the end of it. We screwed it up entirely. Yeah, they won't do that. Nor Cameron. Um, but Minnesota, Mm -hmm. I think, had a pretty cool place and they they tore it. No, no, Minnesota's still old school, the pit's still old school. Mm. the palestra still old school so there's very few places anymore there are we when i was in college oklahoma state built a new arena and it was a mistake like they should have kept they had old uh, gallagher iba and it was a you know five thousand six thousand they did something similar at k-state they had the uh, ahern field house that they made they tore that down and built bramlage coliseum and it's it's every college wants to be a place where you can pack it out with 14,000 fans, but not every college can be that. And so it seems like somebody at some point is going to realize like it would be actually better for us to have a 7,000 seat arena and pack it out every night and turn it into something different. Because if you go to Bramlage Coliseum in Manhattan, 
there's no home court advantage there. It's just, it's a big Morton building, basically. I think they forget. I mean, it, it always comes back to money, of course, but I think in the long run, you would actually make more money making it a harder ticket and making it an interesting place to play. Yeah, and like Georgetown, they play in the Verizon Center in downtown DC. They never sell out, but they have McDonough yeah. Arena, which is like 3,000 people. Mm -hmm. And it, if they let 3,000 people in, it'd be rocking. Like, yeah. and what do you want to play in a sterile NBA half filled arena on a good night? Mm -hmm. Or the rocking yeah. place. And I think, I mean, it's a money thing, obviously, but same at Kentucky. You know, they, uh, they played an NIT game one year and, uh, I don't know, Memorial Coliseum was, or Rupp Arena was books. They played Memorial, which is where they mm. played in back in the 70s when Adolph Rupp was coach and just rocking. Oh, and yeah. It's kind of neat when they, when they do that. Now, mind you, it's all about money now, so you don't see this anymore. But um, right. have yeah, you ever been to Duke, Cameron Indoor for a game? I haven't, no. Yeah, pretty neat. Yeah. Pretty neat. It's right, there with, it's right there with Allen Fieldhouse. So last question. Is the biggest win of your career that win against Kansas? um well let's put it this way that's i would say that's your biggest from reading the book but it, take that one out is there another big win in your career yeah it's i mean the to be non-humble we actually beat kansas at allen fieldhouse to both my junior and senior year so i can sort of can't remember because we got so good at beating them um biggest win of my career uh whew. i don't know like we my my first year of uh, my first year of going to Menorca, Spain, I was there to save the team from relegation. There were eight games left, and my job was to get the team from last place into at least 16th place <laughs> to keep from getting sent to the second division. And we had some wins in that eight game streak that were so gratifying because that was my job, right? It was like, I'm here to help this team win games. And we ended up through a comedy of errors, keeping the team in the first division. Um, but I think a couple of like us, we beat to this, the team I ended up playing for Unicaja Malaga at Malaga. And like, it, it felt like my entire career was on the line. If, we didn't succeed in this so I think that those are were bigger wins for me like being in a place where I'm a pro I'm also contributing quite a lot the team is not like you know it's not like they hired me to be uh Stefan Marbury in China like it, it wasn't like I had to score all the points or something but I was an important part of what we were doing and so I think those meant that I felt a lot of ownership for those wins yeah that's pretty cool. Last thing. Uh, I know you're a music file and been to a lot of concerts. Best concert of all time. Best concert of all time. Man, oh man. That is the most challenging question that there is. Or I a top top three, if, if or one of the top three. Say, uh, the, well, there, I, I didn't really go to music when I was in high school. Never even occurred to me to like drive the 30 minutes to Lawrence, Kansas to see shows. But uh, one year I was home from college and saw in the local newspaper that a band called Mogwai, which the Scottish band was playing in Lawrence, and um, just said to my brother, like, hey, we're old enough now. We can just go to this. And I remember that sense of freedom and then getting there, not really knowing much about them and just being blown away. They, they play like post-rock music, which is very little vocals. They had three guitars and it was just like transcendent from the perspective of me not really understanding how great live music could be until then i also saw the drive-by truckers do you know that band oh yeah um i saw them in new orleans right before katrina hit so there was this like sense in the air of like it's all about to end um which made for a very cool experience um and getting to, like i was i was traveling playing for the Hawks and um, Interpol, who I loved, was playing that night. And I was, I happened to be wearing an Interpol t shirt. We didn't have a game yet that night. And the waiter was like, Hey, do you know they're playing at such and such place? And so I went and scalped tickets. And again, that kind of spur of the moment sense of, mm -hmm. wow, I didn't expect this night to happen the way it did. And then wrote about it. And then their manager got in touch and was like, Hey, why don't you just, 
let us know next time you want to go to shows. So then he would send me like music all the time and we became friends, whatever. So like the, those like weird little bits of the way the world works are the best kinds of concerts, I think. Yeah, that's when the magic happens right there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, perfect. Well, Paul Shirley, uh, thanks so much for joining the podcast today and kind of sharing about your experience, both, you know, in high school, uh, at the high major level, overseas, MBA, and then being an author. I think you offer a unique perspective uh, that a lot of our listeners will enjoy. And um, I really appreciate it. Of course. Thanks for you having me. If people want to find you, Paul, where, where can they find you? Um, they can find me on Twitter at Paul Ben Shirley. Um, or come check out the process, the thing I run. It's at uh, createyourprocess.com. Perfect. Well, thanks again for joining, joining the Prep Athletics Podcast. If you like what you hear, you can subscribe on all the major podcasting platforms. You can subscribe on YouTube to see bonus content. And uh, if you got any feedback or questions, you can find me at prepathletics.com. And uh, we'll have more content like this for you in the future. So thanks so much for tuning in.